So just kind of keep an eye on that time. I had to hand this the bell, so it'll come through the end of the presentation, so don't mind. Welcome back. Um, our second half of the presentation is actually broken into two sections. So we have section four, and we'll take a break, and then we'll have our second session. Mr. Mundy is going to start us off, and he's going to be using access to internet and mobile. All right, so basic human necessities include food, water, and most recently, a stable internet connection. My name is Justin Mundy, and welcome to my BRVGS 2019 senior project. It always seems impossible until it's done. This quote by Nelson Mandela perfectly explains internet access in rural areas. When it comes to technology and internet connection, we were always behind the, the curve from everybody else. And while I was growing up, this excuse me, related directly to me, because I always showed an interest in computers and technology around me, but without that stable internet connection, I wasn't able to fully experience what I could. My focus of research was the economics of bringing internet to rural areas. I decided to focus on the availability of online stores versus brick and mortar stores, the availability of streaming such as Netflix and Hulu, and the availability of bringing sort of off-campus sort of jobs, online jobs to Louisa. So in my research, I found that when I was comparing online versus brick and mortar stores, in urban areas, this is a great thing because the customers have a, access to a much broader range of a catalog. They can really order anything they want. They don't have to, re they don't have to worry about things being out of stock. But small companies and counties such as Louisa are suffering extremely from this because they do not have the internet connection to be able to digitalize their store, meaning all of these customers are going to Amazon, they're going to Walmart, they're not really shopping at their stores. So over time, they're going to have to close and they're just not getting the traffic that they deserve. Next, I focused on streaming. So probably everybody in this room has heard of Netflix or has used Netflix or Hulu or a similar service. And this is amazing for our generation because while DirecTV may be expensive and has commercials and all of the sort, uh, Netflix and Hulu really is at the tip of your fingertips. You can dream whatever you want, whenever you want. But our internet connection in Louisa, the average is about three megabytes per second, is not fast enough to stream HD quality video, which normally takes about eight megabytes per second. So this is really leaving us out of this opportunity completely. Next, I went into working from home. Working from home serves many, uh, excuse me, many positives for the company and the employee themselves. While it is not usually seen as a good thing for the employers, employees that were working from home actually get more work done than if they were working at an on-campus site. But also, we do not have access to this because of our internet connection. Online jobs require uh, frequent online meetings, transferring of large files that our internet speeds and Louisa especially you just can't keep up with. For my podcast, as you guys have heard twice before, I worked on the Nevertheless podcast with Ethan LaBelle and Sophie Ashburn. And Nevertheless is a subsidiary of Pearson. They really focus on STEM, mostly women in STEM, but usually just STEM in the broader sense. So they decided that they wanted to do a student takeover episode. So for the student takeover episode, they got in contact with a school in London, a school in South Africa, and us here in Virginia. So the school in South Africa was given the positives of technology. The school in London was given how technology could be used for good and for bad, while we were in Louisa given how it could be strictly be bad. So while the other schools decided to do an informational podcast, they wanted to interview people, they wanted to get their opinions of how technology could be bad, we decided to take an entire different spin on this. We wanted to tell a story. So together with Sophie and Ethan, we wrote a script, we produced, and we put out the podcast, or our segment of the podcast. The podcast, our segment, follows three students as they are living in a normal community similar to ours, doing through their high school day, but all of a sudden they start hearing sirens, people start freaking out, and there's a nuclear meltdown at a local at a local power plant. And I won't spoil too much of it for you, but you guys can go on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, really anywhere, look for the student takeover episode of Nevertheless, and you can find it. What I found interesting is their directory, their art directory, they actually drew 
our segment down here in the bottom. You can see the nuclear explosion in the background and us driving away. So that's pretty neat. So my mentor for the podcast was Hugh Gary. He's the producer at Story Things. His location in London really prevented us from meeting face to face, but we kept up through emails, Google Hangouts, any way we really could because putting together a podcast is a lot more work than you would think it would be. So my specific part of the podcast, I was both a voice actor and producer. I went into this project extremely interested in soundscapes, really looking at how I can use ambient sounds such as car engines and rustling leaves and just kind of like the bustle of a normal school to really put the listener in an, in an environment and really make them feel like they're there and they're experiencing this. So my favorite part of my project, my community service, I worked with Camp Invention, which is a STEM camp run out of Locust Grove. And they do opportunities for anybody from elementary school all the way up to high school, but their main focus is on the elementary schoolers. My mentor for this project was Miss Jessica Starver. She's the orange STEM coordinator. She was my overseer for the project. She didn't really work directly with me, but if I had any big issues, I would go to her, such as kids bullying each other or there being a lack of materials at a certain module. So what I did personally, I led a group of about 14 students through STEM modules. So anything from creativity to problem solving to arts and crafts. But out of all of them, this one down right here is my absolute favorite. It was called the robotic pet vet. So every student was given a tiny little robot dog and all of them had different issues. So some of them would be missing like a squeak box in the head or they would make a lot of noise when they walked because their gears weren't oiled. So as the week went on, we tasked them to fix these dogs, to change the oil, to replace the squeak box, to, I think one of them was replacing the tail. Some of them did have a broken tail. And as the week went on, they got increasingly attached to these animals. Even though they were robotic, they were coming in every day. They had names for them. But we didn't really tell them they, we, that they could keep them and take them home yet until the last day. And when we did, they were jumping, they were smiling, screaming. It was honestly so exciting. I have never really been interested in teaching or working with students, but this was something that completely flipped my decision. So my personal impact, Camp Invention really taught me leadership in a whole different aspect. You, I looked at leadership as getting the attention of everybody and making sure they were paying attention to what I was doing and they were learning from what I was doing. But Camp Invention told me that this method does not work for young students. They are moving, they're excited, they're really just, they wanna like get hands on with their activities. So I really had to look into how to make all of them interested. Maybe say one kid was interested in football, one kid was interested in nature and National Geographic. Then I had to find a middle ground between these two so they would both be really excited to come to camp every day and work on the modules. For the Nevertheless podcast, this was a huge jump for me. I had never put my voice out for hundreds of thousands of people to be able to listen to. And I'm not an actor, I, especially voice acting, where you have to convey all of that emotion strictly through your voice. This was a huge learning stretch for me. This was not something that I would have ever saw me doing. My future goal is to attend University of Mary Washington for computer science. I am interested in AI development. I've always been doing technology and I'd be very curious to see how I can make technology work technology. I'd like to extend a thank you to the BRVGS class of 2019, the Nevertheless podcast, and Camp Invention. Without Governor's School, I don't think I would have went out and done these different activities and really got the experiences that I do have now. And are there any questions? Um, I don't know if I would make that my main focus, but I would definitely see in my future career how I can go out and I can help the community, including like children. Ms. King? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you listen through the podcast, you'll hear there's multiple environments that we're in. One we're in a school, one we're in, say, a car driving down the road. So either I would go out and I would gather them myself just around the school, or I had access to an online sound database where I would access the sounds. They were all royalty free, so I, they were free to use. And I was really 
a lot into layering all of the sounds to really make sure you're there. Not it's just like one sound playing at a time. So there was overlapping with car doors, car engine noises, people talking like in the background, honking, that sort of thing. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to internet connection in a county like Louisa, there's not the infrastructure that they do have in the more urban areas where everything is wired. We lack the fiber optic. Actually, they are laying more fiber optic cable, but it's very exclusive at this point. So the main thing they're trying to market to rural counties such as Louisa is satellite internet. And satellite internet is just, it doesn't cut it. The, speed, the speeds are slow. The data caps are extremely low. So it's just not a viable option because the ISPs or the internet service providers are kind of greedy with what they're doing. So really what we need to do as rural citizens are to speak up about this and tell these internet service providers that we do need a connection because the digital divide is just gonna keep on growing unless we do make a stand and we get these ISPs to give us the attention we deserve. Any other questions? Thank you.